Welcome everyone to retention and engagement part two. And as you can tell, engagement is a little bigger today because that's really what we're going to be focusing on is engagement. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Amy Julian and I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. Joining me today to present is Sarah Goldhammer and she's with the Southern Illinois Professional Development Center. And also with us from ICSPS is Brittany Boston. We are excited today to have you um, hear from your peers on some great stuff. So what we're going to be talking about today is engagement. Again, this whole series is on engagement and um, retention. And so what you can expect in the next few minutes is we're going to explore some learning communities and cohorts and what that means and what are some ideas and opportunities for that. You're going to get to hear from your peers today. And as we move through the day, we do hope that you nod your head. We hope that you smile and we hope that you scratch down a note or two. A couple of things before we get started. All of you are in listen only mode. So if you have a question, go ahead and post those into the question box or into the chat pane and um, see if you have any questions there. And then in addition to that, if you have um, anything, if you want to raise your hand, you have some opportunities to really kind of show expression and explanation as you go through. So we encourage you to engage with us. So I'm going to hand the floor. I think I hand the floor over to Sarah on this one. Thanks, Amy. And thank you, everybody, for coming today. Hopefully, you've been a part of this series for a while. Um, and um, I just want to thank our pre presenters today. And Claudia is already interacting with you. So way to go, Claudia. I appreciate that. So when we think about virtual learning communities specifically with our students, we really need to make sure that we understand all the possible um, benefits. Well, obviously, one of them is that engagement part that with our students, but also helping their students understand how to embrace technology. Um, this is the world that we live in, like it or not. I don't think this will go away even on the other side of pandemic where our students need to understand technology. So we want to make sure that they have opportunities to embrace it, to enhance learning in a deeper way. And our teachers today are going to give you some great illustrations of how learning communities and cohorts can really enhance learning. And then also promote work skills because our employers are looking for those collaboration skills. They're looking for communication skills and they're looking for good work ethics. So all of those things can be enhanced through learning communities. So as we get started here, we'd like you to throw in the chat, um, just answer in the chat, what have you tried? Um, what have you considered trying but haven't started? And then what's holding you back? And again, just now is the time to get started. So I'll give you just a second to post this in the chat and I'll get us back in order there, Sarah. I'll let you take that one. All right. So as you're putting things in, keep putting it in, but where do you start? Because maybe you're saying, well, I haven't tried it yet. That's why I'm here today, which is fabulous. And if you, and that may be, so I want to encourage you, if you haven't started, this is the time to try new things. We all have been sort of, well, not sort of, we've all been forced to try new things. Everybody's tried a lot of new um, experiences in the last seven, eight months. So um, this is the time to select a, a platform, what works for you, possibly what's free, what does your program have available to you, are there other teachers who are using this that they could help you out, we have our two panelists today, and then identify what you want to achieve, it's really important to have your goals, is it a place that's for students to get together and try things out together with each other. Um, do you want them to be able to collaborate? Because that's going to make a difference in what platform that you're going to choose. And then what levels of communication do you want to achieve? And how often do you want to meet? So all questions to kind of think about as we look at what our, our panelists have to share with you today. And to kind of elaborate that, um, what's the purpose of it? Is it a place for students to connect, discuss, and mentor? And I'm not going to... If I said simply, it's not because that isn't important. It's not a simple thing. Being able to connect, especially now, is so important. We're seeing so many mental health issues. We're seeing um, people, it's, it's a trauma for everyone, for some people more than others. So we want to make sure that we do provide opportunities for students to connect. 
Do you want students to be able to have private conversations? Um, and do you want them to be able to share documents and collaborate? And again, our presenters today are going to share you, so with you, show to you how to do some collaboration and sharing of documents. So what we'd like to do now is just kind of give you some tech ideas. So there are a lot of different platforms you can use, and I'm not saying that any of these are better than any of others. Um, we're going to hear from our peers as to which ones they use and what they use. Um, but some of them do offer different things to you. So GoToMeeting is a platform that is really just, it's a meeting, it's, it's very meeting focused. Zoom Meetings allows you to have breakouts, which is a really a selling point of Zoom Meeting. Microsoft Teams is really one of those platforms that's going to allow you to do file share. It's going to allow you to engage in that way. So that's really important. And then it also allows you to make calls. You can hold meeting on Microsoft Teams. So it does a lot of the things that GoToMeeting and Zoom does, but it also allows you to have that file share and that archive of those files. Google Classroom is phenomenal and Google Meets is kind of an accompaniment to Google Classroom. And that's a really engaging, very similar to Microsoft Teams. Blue Jeans is um, Verizon's version of the GoToMeeting, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams. And you're presented kind of in a Brady Bunch setting there. And so it does really encourage you to turn on your camera. Um, when we do talk about engagement, that is something I know you've heard Sarah and I talk about. When we talk about engagement, it's really important to have your camera on so you can engage with those individuals who you're talking to, your students. And then Blackboard, if you have access to Blackboard at your institution, it has a lot of bells and whistles that really do lend itself to a lovely learning community. So how do you get started? We want you to educate your team on what a learning community really means. You want to start with learning and embrace that collaborative culture to build trust. What are your expectations for your students? And then what are your, their expectations for you? Decide together how those things should run. Decide together how you're going to engage with your students. And then set some SMART goals, some specific, measurable, applicable, realistic, and timelines for your goals. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to go out there and say, hey, I need some help. And all of you probably have access to somebody who's a tech support person. I do want to say a um, big shout out to ISU Tech. They are my favorite people. Sam is amazing. And for a while there through this pandemic, he and I were on the phone every morning. So there's, it's not a bad thing to have to ask for help, um, but it does keep you going and get you up and, and moving back to where you need to be. And then know that things will take time. Don't expect that what we hear from Tara today or from Claudia today, you're going to be able to implement it. It's going to be woohoo, it's going to be up and running. It is going to take a minute or two. So allow that time for buy in and support. The big thing is what are the goals of establishing a learning community? So that's a question to ask. And Sarah talked about that a little bit, but we want to be sure that you're looking at how often your learning community will meet. Um, are you going to meet bi weekly, the first and third Thursday of every month, where every student will attend? Do you want it structured and coordinated? or directed by program administrators? Are you gonna have it open-ended where anyone anytime can post a question that has a flowing conversation like a blog or maybe a bit of both? Think about it like a good meeting. What are those tips to having a good meeting? And then you wanna kind of structure those around your learning community as well. Be sure that people know what they're coming to the learning community for and most importantly, what it is and what it is not. A couple tips for successful learning community, know your online learners needs. So meet your individuals where they are. Set some time to, for net etiquette rules and enforce them. What does that mean? Um, possibly not profanity, possibly making sure your screens are showing or that you're showing your picture um, or your face. Maybe it means that if you do show a picture, as you saw, I clicked my picture off there for a second, that the picture that's up there is actually you. It's not Wonder Woman. And I do use that one from time to time. Um, pick the right online collaboration platform. What is that platform that works best for you? There's not a wrong platform, but there might be a wrong platform for you. So what is the platform that you like the best? For example, we've been in this, what now, seven, eight months. We either like Zoom or we love Zoom or we hate Zoom. We, maybe we are more partisan to WebEx. Maybe we like GoToMeeting better. It doesn't matter. Pick the one that's right for you. That's the one that's best for you. Cultivate a personal connection. Be sure you're meeting students where they are. When we met last week, we talked about really engaging with students and listening when they talk and answering those questions and asking those you know, questions so you can really build that rapport. Be sure that your learning community is cultivating a personal connection as well. Set expectations, we've kind of talked about that. Um, appoint online learning community leaders. Those are those individuals who are going to kind of rally and answer questions, but also those who will be responsible for kind of guiding the conversation. Create a central hub as to where they can go for that information, whether that be on your website 
or maybe you are using like a Microsoft Teams or a Google Classroom for that. And then offer shareable e-learning content to expand your online learning community. And if you would like to develop subcommittees. Now on Teams, you have things like channels that you can develop. And if you wanna learn more about this, we have a whole hour session that we did um, for the Transitions Academy. And we can post that in the chat if you wanna learn more about different tips. But don't do that right now. Stay tuned because we're going to hear from our peers. And I'd like to hand the floor back over to Sarah now to walk through um, and introduce us to our peers that are here today to talk about how they engage with their students. Thanks, Amy. Sarah? And we're gonna let, yeah, we're gonna let Claudia bring up her screen. And while she's doing that, let me just mention one of the tips for successful learning communities, community is for good directions. And one of the things I failed to tell you was to make sure that you uh, uh, put your ideas out there to everybody. So thank you for all the people who pivoted and immediately uh, reposted all of the great ideas. I wanna point out also you guys, how far we have come as a field, because I'm gonna tell you in March and April and May, um, we didn't have tons of people throwing up great ideas like we did today, because you all have learned and you have um, figured out a lot of great ways to engage with learners. And speaking of having peers help each other in a classroom, Claudia has a great example of that because um, she has a student who's starting her class at three o'clock, right, Claudia? Because you have class at three. Yeah, so Claudia, you are muted. So um, why don't you unmute yourself and can you share your screen and we'll go get started. Yeah, so here. I was trying to share, but I think I might need permission. Do I have? Oh, there we go. We got you. Okay. There. Okay, good. So th thank you very much, Claudia, for coming. And Claudia Lopez Heinrich uh, teaches at Elgin and I think a few other places too. So I'll let yeah. her tell you about all the places that she um, that she teaches. And we're gonna I'm gonna mute myself and let Claudia take it away. Okay, yeah. Well, the first thing you can do, I just put a link into chat. So if you click on the link you should be able to sign into Pear Deck. The link should take you right there. Otherwise, the other option is to go to joinpd.com and put in the code XTNOSJ. But if you click on the link, it should take you right to my interactive slides. Um, I'm gonna be using these slides today because I've used them in all my different classes. They're a great way just to foster engagement between and amongst students. So good, I see I have five students connected. Um, also, if you'll see, I have a teacher dashboard on my phone for Pear Deck. So I was explaining to my student, you might see me looking at my phone. I'm not on Facebook. It's actually one way that I interact with my students. I can do some extra things on my phone, but then you'll see up on the screen. So um, I have eight students connected. How many people are in the webinar? Should I wait a little bit longer to see who connects? 11 students. 13. Um, yeah, so um, I, I would go ahead, Claudia. Okay, and, and okay. Thanks. So I'm going to start my class, and I think students should still be able to join. So again, today we're talking about classroom strategies for staying connected. You should be able to see these slides in my... You should have your tab open that has the Pear Deck slides on them so that you can interact. So again, my name is Claudia Lopez Heinrich. Um, I have my master's in TESOL. I teach mainly ESL classes at Elgin Community College. I also teach at Harper, Judson University, and I'm the tutor trainer for the Literacy Connection. And in all those places, like all of you, we've been working really hard to make this shift to online learning. Um, at Elgin Community College, I teach in our ICAPS, an ICAPS course, as well as intermediate ESL this semester. Harper, I'm teaching a digital literacy course virtually online. So that has been a challenge this semester. Um, at Judson University, I'm working with teachers who are studying to be teachers, students who are studying to be teachers, doing an applied linguistics course. And then I'm supporting tutors as they tutor at the Literacy Connection. And I'll just say that fostering this community and interactiveness has been something across all of these, you know, areas. Working from For and are trying to learn how to use a computer at Harper to teachers who are, or students who are studying to be teachers. And I think um, building community and interactivity in an online virtual setting has been something that, that has been across um, all of these areas, all these classes. So one thing I did just wanna share is one good thing that happened 
during this pandemic. It has been a trauma, it has been a challenge for everyone, but my children have been begging for a puppy, begging for a dog for at least five years. So we adopted our little puppy, puppy Molly this summer. This is the kids on the day we brought her home. This is her the night before we got her and a, a little bit later, she's growing into quite a big dog. Um, I'm kind of like a grandparent. I, you know, I talk about my dog first, the grandkids, and then here's an obligatory picture of my family. This is us about a year ago in the fall. So I would like you if, Amy, can we break into breakout rooms just for a minute? Can we put people into pairs and just say, what class or classes are you teaching this semester? And what's something that's brought you joy this semester? Unfortunately, Claudia, Zoom webinar does not no have breakout okay. rooms. All right, then we won't yeah. do the breakout. They can uh, put it in the chat, but. Yeah, why don't we put that in chat then? I apologize. You put in chat, what classes are you teaching this semester? And what's one thing that's brought you joy? So I see some responses. Oops. Oh, thank you. Someone says my dog is adorable. And your joy, family time, definitely. Grandchildren. So yeah, there are still things in this tough situation um, that are still bringing us joy. And maybe it's not work right now, maybe work's a challenge, but sometimes family time or other things going on at home can really um, be something that keeps us going. So just in terms of teaching, I know that we have specific learning communities, but I think teaching is always about building a learning community. And that starts with our authenticity as instructors and building that trust between us and our students and our students amongst each other. But that we really can't build a learning community um, and students won't have those good relationships with each other if we are not feeling like we can build those authentic relationships and that we can be vulnerable and build a community with our students, which I'll just say has been a challenge this semester. I found that I love teaching. And one of the reasons why I feel like I am a teacher is because it, I work hard, but it comes easily. I get so much joy from teaching ESL students. But this semester has not been that way for me. I felt so stressed out starting the semester. And my response was, okay, so I'm gonna plan the perfect semester. And even though it's online and everybody's really stressed out about this, you know, I'm gonna make sure we hit all of our, um, you know, objectives and they're aligned with the other objectives and everything's just gonna be perfect because I'm gonna create the perfect activities and it's all gonna be great. And what I found was I was just really stressed. And when teachers are stressed, it's really hard to build that authentic community. What I found was that my stress can also be a clue to needing to make some changes and ways that I can make things more interactive. Um, so one thing I did was really make it a part of class to share personal information. We only have a few minutes to share today and it was really difficult for me to say, okay, we're gonna do a breakout room and I'm gonna talk about my puppy because I feel like we have so much information that needs to be shared, teachers are, you know, we're working so hard to make this a good experience for my student, but I really wanted to model and also just embody and teach myself that no, we need to make those connections. That's when we can create that authentic community is even things like taking that time to share personal information. It's not a waste of time. One thing that I've done um, is to really be intentional about creating different writing prompts and different assignments where my students are able to share personal information. So when we're um, doing a, a, pair, a descriptive paragraph, the prompts that I gave were things that we're talking about. What's a childhood place that you loved? Who's a person that influenced your life? So now we're still working on writing, but we're also building those personal connections. Because as you see, as we're interacting um, around our writing or around our presentations, we're also sharing who we are and um, building that trust with each other. One thing that I did, um, again, to build those relationships as I scheduled one-to-one -one meetings with my students at the beginning of the semester. So those were only about 20 minutes long. I set up a Google form, students were able to go in, sign up for a time, and then we had that time to meet. And I'll say again, I noticed my stress level went down after that 
because it was so fulfilling to just connect with my students without feeling like, oh my gosh, like, did I give them the right document? And can everyone open it? And, you know, are we meeting our objectives? We, everything feels rushed. Like we just don't have enough time because things take longer, I feel like online, but it was, it was, um, you know, part of my office hours, but I just really tried to connect with those students. And I think it, um, I also think for me, I taught a little bit this summer and I was thinking, oh my gosh, it's week four, it's week five, and I don't know my students' names and I don't feel connected to them. But what I found was this class was only six weeks long, but around weeks five and six, I felt like I was starting to make that connection with my students. It was a pronunciation class, so it doesn't lead as much to sharing about our personal experiences, but we can share about our feelings about language and culture change. And students were starting to do that at the very end of the class, they were laughing more we were more connected. And that's been a good memory for me as well to just remember that, okay, I might not have the same feelings that I do. Usually by week two or three, I feel like I know my students, we have a collaborative culture. It doesn't feel that way to me this year. It takes longer, but rather than give up and just focus on, okay, you know, what's our next writing assignment? We've got to keep moving through this material to just know that, no, it does pay off to keep working on creating these relationships but it is going to take longer. I might feel the way at week five or six that I normally do weeks two or three in my classroom. Um, in terms of just creating an interactive student focused classroom, these are all things that I'm just experimenting with and trying to figure out. But breakout rooms, as you could see, I really like breakout rooms. Um, I think they help build community. I think it's harder for people to keep their cameras off if they're in a breakout room. If it's me and things are going one way with the students, it's easy for everyone to turn their camera off. Are in breakout rooms and doing activities when they're talking to each other. Uh, there's a little more like, you don't wanna be rude to that person and just keep your camera off. Some students might not have, you know, the ability to do it based on Wi-Fi or different things. But um, I just think it helps create that, that reason for turning on your camera. And then students are also be able to build those stronger relationships with each other. When they're working in partners or in small groups, they feel that investment in each other. In terms of content, you're seeing the students, they're getting to contribute more. So our ESL students, rather than you know, one person answering a question, multiple people can be asking and answering questions. So again, it builds that investment and that feeling of really being a part of something rather than just, um, you know, receiving information. And that's been a pretty easy way for me to replicate kind of a small group experience within the, the classroom. In terms of activities for breakout rooms, so we've been doing some work on reading fluency and students will be practicing a passage. And again, they'll be in partners. One student will read, the other student will give feedback and they'll switch. Same thing with writing. We might have a writing paragraph, students will bring their first draft, they'll switch documents with each other and give feedback. Again, getting to know each other. Small group. Um, in my ICAPS class, I've used breakout rooms to where students are creating slides for material that they that they're reviewing, um, reviewing course content, and even working on. My students are EMTB students. If they're learning to do patient assessments, I might um, create some outlines for my students, and then they're able to do that in breakout rooms. Um, if okay, so this is Pear Deck. So you can, you should see uh, next to your slide, a little like bubble box where you can interact. What activities do your students do in breakout rooms? If you've used breakout rooms, what activities do your students do? You can type it right in. And then I can, I can see. Right, and then can I can show responses. I can show responses, this uh, discussion group, group assignments, sharing sentences they've created using certain grammar and brainstorming. So again, this is a great way to build that interactivity um, into the classroom where students are contributing. I can share them anonymously. Um, 
but it gives me an option of having students share share more. So we're one thing that I found as well is that I really missed walking around the classroom. And I felt like I couldn't get that assessment, which again is making me feel distant to my students. I'm like, are they getting it? Are they not? I don't really know. So again, that stress was a clue for me of something needed to change to build that community. And for me, this formative assessment, even though in some ways it's more content-based, I really feel like it's helped us to build a stronger community. Because again, I feel like I know where students are at so I can meet those needs and more students are contributing and seeing um, everyone's able to participate. Uh, so here, so again, this is the idea of recreating formative assessments and how formative assessments builds community. This is Pear Deck, which we've used. So they're interactive slides and students can post responses to the questions. The most, the way I use it the most often is the way you just did it. I pose a question and students are able to type text in. There are a lot of other formats for the deck. Um, there's a free version that I used for a long time this year because of that we're online um, completely. I did use a paid version, which allows me to do some other things. The highlighting responses and showing them anonymously, I believe is a paid feature. And then something else I can do is with the paid feature, I can send my students a copy of the slides and their responses so that they have that after every class. Which again, I really like because we don't have textbooks in class. We're meeting completely online. So this gives them not only what we went over, but their responses to, to it. This is just an example of the Pear Deck slide. So we did something for vocabulary. Our students were looking at a vocabulary word. They were given some examples in a picture. Then they made a prediction. This was the Pear Deck slide where all of my students would say, what is the meaning of indicate? They'd write the meaning of indicate. I could highlight some responses again of students and then show and inf share information about the definition. Again, it was highly interactive and really allowed everyone to participate in class. Um, I don't know if anyone else has used Pear Deck. If you have something else that you've used with your slides, you can share if anyone has used, done a different activity. Responses, I see someone has used multiple choice questions. And uh, teachers have used it to gauge and understanding, putting emojis and having the kids to pick. Good. All right. Um, one other thing that, again, this is a little more content and strategy based, but I feel like just helps with that interactivity. And that I found I was doing, um, again, as a stress response. Like this has been stressful. Normally, I really try to ask a question and then allow my students to answer. I give plenty of time. I know that's an important part of working with ESL and AB students. And what I found was being online, I just wasn't doing that. I was answering a question and immediately responding because I was just nervous and I wanted my students to have a good experience. So um, I just have really had to be intentional again about creating that wait time and letting students respond. I don't want my classroom to be me spewing stuff, information at my students. Um, and that's not how I normally teach, but I found again that I've kind of had to drill down and wait and just really allow people to respond and let, not let my nervousness um, take precedence over what my students really need. Because again, we can't build that community if I'm just talking all the time. So it, I feel like this is a very simple thing, but it's been something that's helped me to and allow those relationships in my classroom to, to strengthen and, and grow stronger just simply by giving more wait time to my students. We can, I, do you wanna go on? We can talk about something you can implement to create a greater sense of community um, or we can move on and maybe let people share at the end. Thanks, Claudia. If anybody wants to put in something, um, I know I've been inspired 
by Claudia and sharing Pear Deck. I really appreciate this. So if you have something that you're thinking you're gonna try, put that in the chat now and inspire it. Make sure you put it to everyone so that we all can see what, what you're gonna do next. Um, and I, I really love Claudia that you shared about bringing your own anxiety down because I think that is so important. We all need to exhale and um, be gracious and give grace to each other. Yeah. And it was easier for me to give grace to my students, but it was really hard for me to give grace to myself. And it took almost half the semester to be like, I don't get everything done in a normal semester. You know, I don't hit every activity. And I just needed to step back and say, you know what, we're not going to do that assignment. We're going to, you know, slow down and, and take time to do something else and just not put that pressure on myself. And I appreciate also you talking about building that community and taking the time up front because sometimes we feel stressed about going through things, but building that relationship up front really does save you time in the long mm -hmm. run. So I want to thank Claudia again for sharing. And um, we have two more presenters today. So I'm going to um, bring up my slides, well, my screen. It's not my slides. It's um, Hold on, uh, Patricia Young is here from Rock Valley. And why is this not making a slideshow? There we go. So Patricia, can you unmute yourself and say hello? Patricia had some uh, tech issues earlier. So uh, speaking of ex hearing? exhale, Patricia, we can hear you and we are excited to hear about your cohort, the cohorts that you're gonna tell us about today. I'm excited to do this, but I was I was like totally prepared and I don't know what my laptop did. I have no idea. So Claudia, I was laughing when you said, you know, take a breath and yeah, I need lots of them right now. So anyway, thanks. I don't, I thought my video was on, but I'm on a whole different setup now. So who knows? But anyway, I'll go ahead. You can't see my hands moving in front of me. So um, yeah, my name is Patricia Young and I'm uh, the director of adult education, the ABE ASC with Rock Valley College. Thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity to let me talk about my, my new pilot program. And I gotta do a big shout out to my co-director because she is always by my side and encouraging me and laughing with me. And uh, thanks, Trisha, I appreciate it. So anyway, I had sent a request or a, a note to, to um, Sarah and said, we're kind of doing something that I didn't know if it was gonna work and it's working and I just gotta tell somebody. So this is exactly part of my email and Sarah said, please include that in your presentation. So this is a story about success in a pan pandemic, not in it, but despite of it. And for some reason, I had this idea that I would just launch a brand new pilot program. Why not? It's a pandemic, you might as well give it a try. So next slide, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so a little background on this, we um, in in uh, March when we, you know, all it all imploded and we all ended up back home and or wherever. Um, I was talking about starting my math boot camp. It would have been my third annual math boot camp. I had an instructor teach it all of May and June in the last two years. So this was the third year of it. And uh, we had great success with it, reached out to a lot of students. Um, a lot of finished up some students who only had the math test left, had some higher ESL level students involved, and it was just a really good group. So I was thinking, huh, I wonder if we can do this online. So I brought together um, the teacher who had taught it before, plus another teacher. My one teacher is, is kind of old school, does a lot of um, board work and that kind of thing. And the other teacher was very much my probably most tech savvy teacher. So. Um, I brought them together and I said, you know, I really want to do math boot camp, but we have to do it online. And their first answer was, we can't do it online. And I went, well, let's give it a try and see what happens. So they got together, they kind of put their um, heads together and created a, a, a structure of what they wanted it to look like. Started out a little rough, even with the students and, and, and the teachers, but as it progressed, it, it turned out amazing. And um, I was getting texts and emails from them all through the week saying, this is really cool. And, and this is, we're really loving this. And this is a perfect way to do it. So they were team teaching this class um, through the Zoom platform. 
And uh, basically one would be teaching why the other one was kind of watching the students and jumping in, taking them into the breakout rooms to help them with other, you know, um, things. And um, it just worked out really well. So then I thought, hmm, if this is so successful, I wonder if I can launch something that's been floating around in my head um, for a while now. And that is like a fast track GD program. And um, we, we as in Trisha, but we named it GED Booyah, just for the fun of it, for no other reason than it's just fun to say GED Booyah. And we set it up. So I came to, um, I got together on a Zoom meeting with these, um, these two same instructors. And I said, what do you think about that, this? I got this idea. And they just laughed and they said, you know what? We're already on this. We think this is just the best way to teach. And we're just gonna go tell us, give us some more details, give us some parameters or work within and, and we've got this. And I'm like, okay. Um, luckily in August, um, Rock Valley um, was very, very generous with our adult education program and let us do under every stringent um, CDC and Rock Valley guidelines, um, some face-to-face -face testing. So we were very, very fortunate to let that, to have that happen for us. So what we did is um, we did CASA schools um, reading assessments for our students. And as we looked at the results, we started pulling out the, the, the highest, um, the people who scored the highest. It was just like, how are we gonna do this and how will we identify it? And that's what we did. So we pulled out mostly everybody that scored at a, an RS level six. We did have some fives in there. We also had a few people that had been with us before that we were kind of thinking, let's throw them in and see if it's, it's just gonna work for them. So um, that's how we identified the students, kind of a shot in the dark. We piloted it two, two different ways. One was we had a regular NRS 5-6 class, um, and then the, the Booya students met um, separately beyond that class. And then we did a, a <clears throat> excuse me, a, an evening class where um, it was just all Booya students. So this, the instructors wrote a program, very structured, eight weeks. They basically instruct the um, first week. Over the weekend, the students have to um, take a practice test. They get back together the next week and go over whatever they need, prep them, and they schedule the first test or a test in that week. So each two weeks, they're taking a test. I, it's it was crazy and I didn't know if it was going to work, but um, let me share you some results and this is the part that makes it so much fun. Thank you, Sarah. So we started um, the morning class had 11 students in it and that was the class that was paired with the um, The NRS level five six class and then we had nine active students in the night class and that was the standalone and these are the results we got in an eight week cohort. We had 49 total tests were taken. We had eight graduates, five students um, who had completed two tests. One student had just completed one test. And then at the end in, in October, when that eight weeks ended, we had also nine students from the first cohort sign up to finish with the second cohort. And, and just before I got, got onto my, or tried to get online here, um, I got an email from one or a text from one of the instructors that said we had another graduate. So we're actually up to, to 10 grads now. But um, and then on top of that, we had them aligned with our transitions coordinator. She jumped into um, to um, all the, the Zoom classes. So here I am kind of coordinated a, a career exploration that was a homework assignment for the students. She got those results. And then from there, she's met with um, all the students who have finished and then um, uh, quite a few of them who are just on their last test. So um, we've just had terrific, terrific results from this. Never dreamed in a million years that this was going to work the way it did. Um, now, of course, these two instructors are begging me to let me figure out how to make this happen in the spring, and I'm sure it will <clears throat> in some way, shape or form. But we are so up in the air on what the spring is going to look like for our uh, program. We're not exactly sure, but it, it's been exciting and it's really fun to um, to share that and how it worked out. So um, I don't know, I could take questions at this point. I probably talk so fast and I have no notes and nothing because it's on my computer that's um, in La La Land or somewhere. I don't know where it is. So 
Any questions? Oh, I can. Patricia, read the chat. if you have if you have questions, put them in the chat, or we can unmute you. But I just want to say thank you for persevering through the tech issues today. We really appreciate that. Well, I, it's something that's just been fun. I certainly, if anybody's got questions and wants to um, want you know details, how, what did the structure look like? What did you? How did you sign? Um, set up the eight weeks. Um, we even snuck a constitution testing in there so that they they could all finish. But um, it's been good. The students absolutely loved it. We had um, we were really strict with the participation at the very beginning when we identified the students. One of the instructors called each one of called the student individually and said, "You know, we've got this new program. We're just piloting it. Are you interested? And will you commit? Because um, if they miss more than two classes, we just." kind of transfer them to the to the regular classes then instead of the the fast track booyah so um they want to do it um they're excited and they're just the students are over the moon that they could come in work really hard for eight weeks and then they're done and then they're moving on and i guess my um the people who know me very well say have heard me say a thousand times over what do we how can we serve the students and we know that this is a really difficult time to make things happen in our classrooms. Um, but despite the pandemic, we are serving our students. We're seeing success and in, in maybe launching them into something else that's bigger and better for them. So it's been really a, a fun experience. We will um, absolutely incorporate Booyah into our um, our regular programming. So um, let me see, I've got somebody well, said- with the, Well, Patricia, with the success you had, it would be hard not to keep it. <laughs> keep it going. And we do have a couple of questions that are there, but if it's okay. all with you, what I'd like to suggest, because we have one more presenter, right. is let's hear from Tara. And then at the very end, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the assignment. You can read um, the question that we have uh, sure. in the chat and then kind of be prepared to answer that in a little bit if you could. But thank That's you perfect. very much. Um, Tara, if you want to go ahead and bring your screen up and get ready to present. I will mention you guys, Patricia mentioned this at the beginning. She reached out to me and she was so excited. She goes, this is what we have going on. And um, so please do that. If you have any promising practices you can share for the field, do exactly what Patricia did and send me an email. I put it in the chat there so that um, uh, we can highlight what you're doing as well. And okay, so Patricia, oh, I need to stop sharing, huh? Yep, thanks. Thanks, Tara, for sending. Tara sent me a little message. She said, hey, stop being so selfish and stop sharing so that I can. So um, Tara Schwab is here. Um, she teaches at Wabanzi and also College of DePage. So Tara, I'm going to let you take it away and I'm going to stop talking. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. And um, it's been great to talk to you, great ideas. I can't wait to start the Pear Deck. And I loved your comment about um, both, about simple reminders. And it's just nice to be able to collaborate and kind of share what we're doing. So thank you for that. Whoopsie, here we go. So a few things um, that I wanted to talk about when I was just starting to think about some things here, I was thinking about synchronous classes versus asynchronous classes. So we've had a little talk about cameras so far. So just like the rest of you, and I completely agree with the breakout rooms, I'll pop in, I'm like, oh, there's that person, haven't seen them all day. But um, just some ideas, I try to keep it light at the beginning. So sometimes, you know, I'll say, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you. Oh, it's so good to see your face. And then if someone still doesn't have it on, you know, sometimes I'll make a comment to the class like, hey, you guys, it really helps with our engagement if you could turn on your cameras if possible. And then of course, you know, kind of a scaffolded um, setting there. So if they're still not coming on, maybe a private message, you know, is there something with your computer that I can help you with? It's okay either way, but you know, if you can come on, that would be awesome. Um, and then I've found that just like in my I sometimes stop and think, you know, what do I do in my classroom live that I that I haven't been doing on Zoom and could I implement them that and how could that affect, you know, my virtual classroom. So I thought to myself, you know what, I always did a warm up 
you know, when I first started this in the spring, I always had a warm up, something for my students to do when they walked in the classroom. Some come earlier than others, etc. So I started to do that. And I think my students are used to it now. I'm on the screen when they come in in the morning, but I also have the whiteboard up with some kind of question, some kind of activity for them to do. And then typically they share their answers in the chat. And it took a few days for people to be comfortable. And a couple of people, I jumped on the Zoom afterwards and kind of went over the chat. But then after a while, everyone's sharing on the chat. And then we typically, after a few minutes, um, come all together and either break out and go into discussion about it, or we kind of discuss it as a class before we sort of get started. So it's still nice to implement those routines to have, you know, students have something to look forward to. They know what's coming next. We all kind of like that, right? So um, breakout rooms, we've already kind of talked about that a lot. So I won't say too much about that. I have been trying to mix it up a little more. Lately, you can assign different people, sometimes do three, sometimes do two, sometimes four. So that's helped. Um, but in a couple of situations um, with book clubs and a couple of other things, some people have been in a little bit more of a cohort style where they sort of stay together. So it's nice to kind of try out both to see what works. Um, polling. So if you're using Zoom, I, Zoom and Blackboard Collaborate are the platforms that I'm most familiar with that have polling that's really easy to use. So if you haven't used polling yet, that might be one thing I would suggest that you encourage yourself to try. So in Zoom, you set up the poll before your meeting. So if you go to the meeting settings, you'll see at the bottom, you can add a poll. And so I've done it for recall. Um, I've done it for how students are feeling about certain things. Uh, I typically do one about comfort with technology at the beginning of class. And then we kind of talk about that. So I love putting polling in and it's interactive and it's all part of the, the Zoom platform. So that's been good. And then in asynchronous classrooms, so one thing, and again, I always try to keep it light and, you know, this isn't required, but it really helps if you would add a picture to your profile. So especially if your class is in an LMS um, like Blackboard, it's really easy. And sometimes I'll either post a video of how to add a picture to the profile, or if we meet on the first day, I share my screen and go through and show students how to add pictures to their profile. So that it just really helps in discussion boards and such to be able to see each other's faces, especially in classes where you don't really meet live, you know, at all. So, and then on the discussion boards in asynchronous classrooms, um, I try to let them know, you know, I'm always here. Sometimes depending on the conversation, I will jump in or I won't, but I definitely try to chime in. Every couple of days, I'll kind of go in there and see if I can reply just so I'm part of the discussion and I can see what students are saying. So it's good for me and it's good for the students to see that we're all involved in the discussion. And, and that's been really good. We've had, I've had some really good discussions virtually, you know, with students on Blackboard or Canvas. So um, feedback on assignments. So um, I think it's really important, especially when you're giving students feedback on their assignments through a learning management system, that we model the type of communication that we expect from them as well. So on the discussion board, a lot of times, you know, in my syllabus or in the instructions for the discussion board, I'll say, please respond to a couple of, you know, typical to a couple of your classmates with a little more than good point. You know, so then I try to do the same for my students on their assignments just to give them substantive feedback and, and such. So I think that's really important for our students. Routines, whoops, oh my gosh, it's happening. Okay. So again, establishing routines and um, a couple of the others kind of hit on these things too, like learning what is working best for us. And I really liked Amy's point about that too. Like we have to kind of explore and learn what's best for us and then that's the right thing for us. Um, so I feel like I've done that with my grade book situational. It's taken me a minute to figure out my routines and they were a little bit different than they were in the classroom, but I do spend a little extra time before each class now going through and making myself some Google Forms um, with the students' names, their email addresses, their phone numbers, and then I always leave blanks to write 
things in. Um, and so then each day I have another form with all blanks and I put their attendance and then I write all their hours on there. We have to do everything electronically, but I like to have just a couple of pages in front of me that I can always jot notes on um, and use as kind of a written grade book before I put everything in electronically. But um, when I transition from in person to virtually, especially at Obansi, we're using Canvas. So students were kind of already in a routine about using some of, with using some of the resources like iPathways and ReadWorks. We had already been using a lot of those. And so I would put the assignments in Canvas, but then I wouldn't, I would always respond. I would just write down their hours and everything outside of Canvas. And then I would just say, oh, good job. Or I'd give them their hours for the week. But then I realized it wasn't, then Canvas kind of lost some of its, you know, importance to students. So then I realized it was something so simple, but I need to grade those assignments in Canvas so they can see the points coming back. They can see that I'm in there. If I'm going to have them use Canvas, I need to legitimize it in a way. So that was really important. Um, so, you know, um, written down, sometimes I'll print something out and write on it and then take a picture of it and scan into it, scan it and send it to the students. So that's just like a little personal touch sometimes for their writing. I like to just kind of write on their homework. Sometimes I'll, you know, change my font to red and correct their writing and send it back. But a lot of times I like to do that just for a little personal touch too when I'm grading. So check-ins. Um, sometimes I sent one this week to my students because we're going from hybrid back to all virtual at Wabanzi. So I just wanted to check in about how they're feeling about all the technology and Canvas. So I sent everyone a Google form through texting and asked them to, you know, give me some feedback. And Sarah was going to post that in the chat. I made an extra copy. If you want to use that, feel free. And then exit slips. I also do those over Google Forms. I put a little picture of one right here. Sometimes I'll do like a recall or, you know, what's the most important thing you learned today, something like that. Um, our class, I want to make sure I get to the next slide, but and I only have a couple of minutes. Class pages, you know, where does your class live? I use Weebly if we don't have a learning management system. It's free. The students don't have to have a login or anything like that. And I always post recordings of my Zooms and make sure to have accessibility features turned on as well. <coughs> I want to make sure to get to this one because someone else talked about, we were talking about this on the chat. Um, I'm a huge advocate of texting students. It's made a world of difference in my virtual teaching. So I think I got everyone's names out of here, but this is a text I sent to one of them. He's not even in my class anymore, but I texted him the other day. <laughs> what are you doing? Taking an online GED test. <coughs> so you can see I send a lot of different things to my students through here. I tried Flipgrid the other day, and so I texted him a link for Flipgrid. Um, so that's me again doing it's different than when I was in person I spend a little extra time before each class. Making a contact for each student through Google and then I use Google voice. Um, to and I give them a label so I label them all with my different classes and I use Google voice to text my students. And I only use it for school so that way I know that if I get a text or a phone call through Google voice it's one of my students and it doesn't get stuck in like a soccer mom carpooling text. And I also reached out to a couple of colleagues who use Remind and WhatsApp. And um, honestly, the couple of people that I talked to, they, they use different ones just because it's the ones they started with. It seems like they have a lot of different, uh, a lot of similar features. The only plus um, I saw that on Google Voice, there is a limit to how much you can, how many people you can have in a group text. Um, I don't typically send group texts to my students just because I'm not sure if they want to be on group text with other people and have their numbers on there. But I think through WhatsApp, you can send a group text and then they don't see everyone else's numbers on there. And there doesn't seem to be a limit to the number of people you can have in a group. So that might be something that's a good idea. And here's some couple of questions that I'll ask myself, you know, sometimes, okay, I send everyone the information they need for class, but is there someone I could reach out to to say, hey, you're doing an extra good job or an extra reminder for someone or something like this? You know, could I reach out to a student that maybe isn't in class anymore, but I knew they needed a couple more GED tests or something like that? So 
it's just made a world of difference for me. Should I do another slide, Sarah, or I got to stop now? Um, yeah, we're almost at time, Tara. Thanks. But can you tell them just a little bit since you mentioned Flipgrid and that was something that some people have been asking about? Can you talk about it for just 30 seconds? And oh, that... absolutely. And if you want to come on Thursday, too, I'm going to have a whole thing on it. But um, oh, Flipgrid... OK, you know what? You know what? Then let's do that so that we um, Let's let's wait until Thursday and that's our hook to tell all of our participants to come back on Thursday at two o'clock. So thank you for that. Um, do you have anything else you wanted to share Tara before we go and have Patricia answer the question and kind of wrap up. Oh, that's okay. No, I'm sure they can see these. Um, you know, the couple slide it, there was just this one slide that I didn't get to and I'd love to hear Patricia's answer too. So yeah, it's all good. All right. Hey, thank you, Tara. I really appreciate it. And you guys, all these presentations, all of them are recorded. And Amy, could you, or Brittany, could you possibly put the link in the chat so people know where to go for future recordings? And also the slides are there. Um, so Patricia, do you want to unmute yourself and answer the question about uh, earlier about the transitioning services? Uh oh, it looks like Patricia may be having some um, technology issues again. Oh, there oh, she is. There. Oh, hey, oh look, I'm here. Hey. Okay. Um, yeah, so somebody asked about the career exploration, and I was, why I read it, I was thinking, I can't remember what it is. But um, I, if my name's on, the, or my contact information is on that, um, the, my final slide. So please reach out to me, and in between there, I'll get the information from from Jenny, our transitions coordinator. I can't remember which one she said she was going to use. So, I think okay. That's thank you very much. Um, we have just two minutes left. Um, so, thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, I think they, if you wouldn't mind, presenters, maybe putting your contact information if you're willing to let people contact you if they um, have any additional questions. Remember, you guys keep those good ideas coming. Let's share, let's help each other through this time. Um, so we really appreciate the presenters today. And remember, there's one more uh, engagement and retention webinar this Thursday at two o'clock. And Amy, do you have anything else you wanna share with people before we log off and let Claudia get to her three o'clock class? I think you covered all, Tara. We did, sorry, Sarah. We did put the link, both Brittany and I posted the link to where all of these sessions, both recruitment and retention um, and engagement are all posted on our website. So please go check those out. And um, thank you to our fantastic presenters today. We truly appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And um, thank you to all of you who attended and um, please be safe, be well, and um, have a wonderful day. And we'll see you on Thursday. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you.